This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Kristen McQuillan. Old Christmas by Washington Irving. Christmas Eve. St. Francis and St. Benedict, bless this house from wicked wight, from the nightmare and the goblin, that is height, good fellow Robin. Keep it from all evil spirits, fairies, weasels, rats, and ferrets, from curfew time to the next prime. Cartwright. It was a brilliant moonlight night, but extremely cold. Our chaise whirled rapidly over the frozen ground, the postboy smacked his whip incessantly, and a part of the time his horses were on a gallop. <laughs> he knows where he's going, said my companion, laughing, and is eager to arrive in time for some of the merriment and good cheer of the servants' hall. My father, you must know, is a bigoted devotee of the old school, and prides himself upon keeping up something of the old English hospitality. He is a tolerable specimen of what you will rarely meet with nowadays in its purity, the old English country gentleman. For our men of fortune spend so much of their time in town, and fashion is carried so much into the country, that the strong, rich peculiarities of ancient rural life are almost polished away. My father, however, from early years, took Honest Peacham's Complete Gentleman, 1622, for his textbook instead of Chesterfield. He determined in his own mind that there was no condition more truly honorable and enviable than that of a country gentleman on his paternal lands and therefore passes the whole of his time on his estate. He is a strenuous advocate for the revival of the old rural games and holiday observances, and is deeply read in the writers, ancient and modern, who have treated on the subject. Indeed, his favorite range of reading is among the authors who flourished at least two centuries since, who, he insists, wrote and thought more like true Englishmen than any of their successors. He even regrets sometimes that he's not been born a few centuries earlier, when England was itself and had its peculiar manners and customs. As he lives some distance from the main road, in a rather lonely part of the country, without any rival gentry near him, he has that most enviable of all blessings to an Englishman, an opportunity of indulging the bent of his own humor without molestation. Being representative of the oldest family in the neighborhood, and a great part of the peasantry being his tenants, he is much looked up to, and in general is known simply by the appellation of the squire, a title which has been accorded to the head of the family since time immemorial. I think it best to give you these little hints about my worthy old father, to prepare you for any little eccentricities that might otherwise appear absurd. We had passed for some time along the wall of a park, and at length the chaise stopped at the gate. It was in a heavy, magnificent old style of iron bars, fancifully wrought at the top into flourishes and flowers. The huge square columns that supported the gate were surmounted by the family crest. Close adjoining was a porter's lodge, sheltered under dark fir trees and almost buried in shrubbery. The postboy rang a large porter's bell, which resounded through the still frosty air, and was answered by the distant barking of dogs, with which the mansion-house seemed garrisoned. An old woman immediately appeared at the gate. As the moonlight fell strongly upon her, I had full view of a little primitive dame, dressed very much in the antique taste, with a neat kerchief and stomacher, and her silver hair peeping from under a cap of snowy whiteness. She came curtsying forth with many expressions of simple joy at seeing her young master. Her husband, it seems, was up at the house keeping Christmas Eve in the servants' hall. They could not do without him, as he was the best hand at a song and story in the household." My friend proposed that we should alight and walk through the park to the hall, which was at no great distance, while the chaise should follow on. Our road wound through a noble avenue of trees, among the naked branches of which the moon glittered as she rolled through a deep vault of a cloudless sky. The lawn beyond was sheeted with a slight covering of snow, which here and there sparkled as the moonbeams caught a frosty crystal, and at a distance might be seen a thin transparent vapor stealing up from the low grounds, and threatening gradually to shroud the landscape. My companion looked round him with transport. "'How often,' said he, "'have I scampered up this avenue on returning home on school vacations? How often have I played under these trees when a boy? I feel a degree of filial reverence for them, as we look up to those who've cherished us in childhood. My father was always scrupulous in exacting our holidays, and having us around him on family festivals. 
He used to direct and superintend our games with the strictness that some parents do the studies of their children. He was very particular that we should play the old English games according to their original form, and consulted old books for precedent and authority for every merry disport. Yet I assure you, there never was pedantry so delightful. It was the policy of the good old gentleman to make his children feel that home was the happiest place in the world, and I value this delicious home feeling as one of the choicest gifts a parent can bestow. We were interrupted by the clangor of a troop of dogs of all sorts and sizes, mongrel, puppy, whelp, and hound, and curs of low degree, that, disturbed by the ringing of the porter's bell and the rattling of the chaise, came bounding open-mouthed across the lawn. The little dogs and all, Tray, Blanche, and Sweetheart, see they bark at me! Cried Bracebridge, laughing. At the sound of his voice, the bark was changed into a yelp of delight, and in a moment he was surrounded and almost overpowered by the caresses of the faithful animals. We had now come in full view of the old family mansion, partly thrown in deep shadow and partly lit up by the cold moonshine. It was an irregular building of some magnitude and seemed to be of the architecture of different periods. One wing was evidently very ancient, with heavy stone shafted bow windows. Jutting out and overrun with ivy, from among the foliage of which the small diamond shaped panes of glass glittered with the moonbeams. The rest of the house was in the French taste of Charles the Second's time, having been repaired and altered, as my friend told me, by one of his ancestors, who returned with that monarch at the Restoration. The grounds about the house were laid out in the old formal manner of artificial flower beds, clipped shrubberies, raised terraces, and heavy stone balustrades. Ornamented with urns, a leaden statue or two, and a jet of water. The old gentleman, I was told, was extremely careful to preserve this obsolete finery in all its original state. He admired this fashion in gardening, it had an air of magnificence, was courtly and noble, and befitting good old family style. The boasted imitation of nature in modern gardening had sprung up with modern republican notions, but did not suit a monarchical government. It smacked of the levelling system. I could not help smiling at this introduction of politics into gardening, though I expressed some apprehension that I should find the old gentleman rather intolerant in his creed. Frank assured me, however, that it was almost the only instance in which he had ever heard his father meddle with politics, and he believed that he had got this notion from a member of parliament who once passed a few weeks with him. The squire was glad of any argument to defend his clipped yew trees and formal terraces, which had been occasionally attacked by modern landscape gardeners. As we approached the house, we heard the sound of music, and now and then a burst of laughter from one end of the building. This, Bracebridge said, must proceed from the servants' hall, where a great deal of revelry was permitted, and even encouraged by the squire throughout the twelve days of Christmas, provided everything was done comfortably to ancient usage. Here were kept up the old games of hoodman blind, shoe the wild mare, hot cockles, steal the white loaf, bob apple, and snapdragon. The Yule log and Christmas candle were regularly burnt. And the mistletoe, with its white berries, hung up to the imminent peril of all the pretty housemaids. So intent were the servants upon their sports that we had to ring repeatedly before we could make ourselves heard. On our arrival being announced, the squire came out to receive us, accompanied by his two other sons, one a young officer in the army, home on leave of absence, the other an Oxonian, just from the university. The squire was a fine, healthy looking old gentleman with silver hair curling lightly around an open, florid countenance, in which a physiognomist with the advantage, like myself, of a previous hint or two might discover a singular mix of whim and benevolence. The family meeting was warm and affectionate. As the evening was far advanced, the squire would not permit us to change our travelling dresses, but ushered us at once to the company, which was assembled in a large old fashioned hall. It was composed of different branches of a numerous family connection, where there were the usual proportion of old uncles and aunts, comfortably married dames, superannuated spinsters, blooming country cousins, half fledged striplings, and bright eyed boarding school hoydens. They were variously occupied, some at a round game of cards, others conversing around the fireplace. At one end of the hall, a group of the young folks, some nearly grown up, others of a more tender and budding age, fully engrossed by a merry game. And a profusion of wooden horses, penny trumpets, and tattered dolls about the floor showed traces of a troop of little fairy beings who, having frolicked through a happy day, had been carried off to slumber through a peaceful night. While the mutual greetings were going on between Bracebridge and his relatives, I had time to scan the apartment. I have called it a hall, for so it had certainly been in old times, and the squire had evidently endeavored to restore it to something of its primitive state. 
Over the heavy projecting fireplace was suspended a picture of a warrior in armor standing by a white horse, and on the opposite wall hung helmet, buckler, and lance. At one end, an enormous pair of antlers were inserted in the wall, the branches serving as hooks on which to suspend hats, whips, and spurs, and in the corners of the apartments were fowling pieces, fishing rods, and other sporting implements. The furniture was of the cumbrous workmanship of former days, though some articles of modern convenience had been added, and the oaken floor had been carpeted, so that the whole presented an odd mixture of parlor and hall. The grate had been removed from the wide, overwhelming fireplace to make way for a fire of wood, in the midst of which was an enormous log glowing and blazing, and sending forth a vast volume of light and heat. This, I understood, was the Yule log, which the squire was particular in having brought in and illumined on a Christmas Eve, according to ancient custom. It was really delightful to see the old squire seated in his hereditary elbow chair by the hospitable fireside of his ancestors, and looking around him like the son of a system. Beaming warmth and gladness to every heart. Even the very dog that lay stretched at his feet as he lazily shifted his position and yawned would look fondly up in his master's face, wag his tail against the floor, and stretch himself again to sleep, confident of kindness and protection. There is an emanation from the heart in genuine hospitality which cannot be described, but it's immediately felt and puts the stranger at once at his ease. I had not been seated many minutes by the comfortable hearth of the worthy cavalier before I found myself as much at home as if I had been one of the family. Supper was announced shortly after our arrival. It was served up in a spacious oaken chamber, the panels of which shone with wax, and around which were several family portraits decorated with holly and ivy. Besides the accustomed lights, two great wax tapers called Christmas candles, wreathed with greens, were placed on a highly polished buffet among the family plate. The table was abundantly spread with substantial fare, but the squire made his supper of frumenty, a dish made of wheat cakes boiled in milk with rich spices, being a standing dish in old times for Christmas Eve. I was happy to find my old friend, minced pie, in the retinue of the feast, and finding him to be perfectly orthodox, and that I need not be ashamed of my predilection, I greeted him with all the warmth wherewith we usually greet an old and very genteel acquaintance. The mirth of the company was greatly promoted by the humors of an eccentric personage whom Mr. Bracebridge always addressed with the quaint appellation of Master Simon. He was a tight, brisk little man, with the air of an errant old bachelor. His nose was shaped like the bill of a parrot, his face slightly pitted with the smallpox, with a dry perpetual bloom on it like a frost bitten leaf in autumn. He had an eye of great quickness and vivacity, with a drollery and lurking waggery of expression that was irresistible. He was evidently the wit of the family, dealing very much in sly jokes and innuendos with the ladies, and making infinite merriment by harpings upon old themes, which, unfortunately, my ignorance of the family chronicles did not permit me to enjoy. It seemed to be his great delight during supper to keep a young girl next to him in a continual agony of stifled laughter, in spite of her awe of the reproving looks of her mother who sat opposite. Indeed, he was the idol of the younger part of the company, who laughed at everything he said or did, and at every turn of his countenance. I could not wonder at it, for he must have been a miracle of accomplishments in their eyes. He could imitate Punch and Judy, make an old woman out of his hand with the assistance of a burnt cork and a pocket handkerchief, and cut an orange into such a ludicrous caricature that the young folks were ready to die with laughing. I was let briefly into his history by Frank Bracebridge. He was an old bachelor of a small independent income. By which careful management was sufficient for all his wants. He revolved through the family system like a vagrant comet in its orbit, sometimes visiting one branch and sometimes another quite remote, as is often the case with gentlemen of extensive connections and small fortunes in England. He had a chirping, buoyant disposition, always enjoying the present moment, and his frequent change of scene and company prevented his acquiring those rusty, unaccommodating habits with which old bachelors are so uncharitably charged. He was a complete family chronicle, being versed in the genealogy, history, and intermarriages of the whole house of Bracebridge, which made him a great favorite with the old folks. He was a beau of all the elder ladies and superannuated spinsters, among whom he was habitually considered rather a young fellow, and he was a master of the revels among the children, so that there was not a more popular being in the sphere in which he moved than Mr. Simon Bracebridge. Of late years, he had resided almost entirely with the squire, to whom he had become a factotum, and whom he particularly delighted by jumping with his humor in respect to old times, and by having a scrap of an old song to suit every occasion. 
we had presently a specimen of this last-mentioned talent, for no sooner was supper removed, and spiced wines and other beverages peculiar to the season introduced, than Master Simon was called on for a good old Christmas song. He bethought himself for a moment, and then, with a sparkle of the eye, and a voice that was by no means bad, excepting that it ran occasionally into a falsetto like the notes of a split reed, he quavered forth a quaint old ditty. Now Christmas is come, let us beat up the drum, and call all our neighbors together, and when they appear, let us make them such cheer as will keep out the wind and the weather. The supper had disposed every one to gaiety, and an old harper was summoned from the servants' hall, where he had been strumming all the evening, and to all appearance, comforting himself with some of the squire's home brood. He was a kind of hanger-on, I was told, of the establishment, and, though ostensibly a resident of the village, was oftener to be found in the squire's kitchen than his own home, the old gentleman being fond of the sound of harp in the hall. The dance, like most dances after supper, was a merry one. Some of the older folks joined in, and the squire himself figured down several couples with a partner with whom he affirmed he danced at every Christmas for nearly half a century. Master Simon, who seemed to be a kind of connecting link between the old times and the new, and to be withal a little antiquated in the taste of his accomplishments, evidently piqued himself on his dancing, and was endeavouring to gain credit by the heel and toe, rigadoon, and other graces of the ancient school, but he had unluckily assorted himself with a little romping girl from boarding-school, who, by her wild vivacity, kept him continually on the stretch, and defeated all his sober attempts at elegance. Such are the ill-assorted matches to which antique gentlemen are unfortunately prone. The young Oxonian, on the contrary, had led out one of his maiden aunts, on whom the rogue played a thousand little knaveries with impunity. He was full of practical jokes, and his delight was to tease his aunts and cousins, yet, like all madcap youngsters, he was a universal favorite among the women. The most interesting couple in the dance was the young officer and a ward of the squires, a beautiful blushing girl of seventeen. From several shy glances which I had noticed in the course of the evening, I suspected there was a little kindness growing up between them, and indeed the young soldier was just the hero to captivate a romantic girl. He was tall, slender, and handsome, and like most young British officers of late years, had picked up various small accomplishments on the continent. He could talk French and Italian, draw landscapes, sing very tolerably, dance divinely, but above all he had been wounded at Waterloo. What girl of seventeen, well-read in poetry and romance, could resist such a mirror of chivalry and perfection? The moment the dance was over, he caught up a guitar, and lolling against the old marble fireplace, in an attitude which I am half inclined to suspect was studied, began the little French air of the troubadour. The squire, however, exclaimed against having anything on Christmas Eve but good old English, upon which the young minstrel, casting up his eye for a moment, as if in an effort of memory, struck into another strain, and with a charming air of gallantry gave Herrick's night-piece to Julia. Her eyes the glow-worm lend thee, the shooting stars attend thee, and the elves also, whose little eyes glow, like the sparks of fire, befriend thee. No will-o'-the-wisp mislight thee, nor snake or glow-worm bite thee, but on, on thy way, not making a stay, since ghost there is none to affright thee. Then let not the dark thee cumber, what though the moon does slumber, the stars of the night will lend thee their light, like tapers clear without number. Then, Julia, let me woo thee, and thus, thus come unto me, and when I shall meet thy silvery feet, my soul I'll pour into thee. The song might have been intended in compliment to the fair Julia, for so I found his partner was called, or it might not. She, however, was certainly unconscious of any such application, for she never looked at the singer, but kept her eyes cast upon the floor. Her face was suffused, it is true, with a beautiful blush, and there was a gentle heaving of the bosom, but all that was doubtless caused by the exercise of the dance. Indeed, so great was her indifference that she was amusing herself with plucking to pieces a choice bouquet of hothouse flowers, and by the time the song was concluded, the nosegay lay in ruins on the floor. The party now broke up for the night with the kind-hearted old custom of shaking hands. As I passed through the hall on the way to my chamber, the dying embers of the yule clog still sent forth a dusky glow and had it not been the season when no spirit dares stir abroad, I should have been half tempted to steal from my room at midnight, and peep whether the fairies might not be at their revels about the hearth. 
My chamber was in the old part of the mansion, the ponderous furniture of which might have been fabricated in the days of the giants. The room was panelled with cornices of heavy carved wood, in which flowers and grotesque faces were strangely intermingled, with a row of black-looking portraits staring mournfully at me from the walls. The bed was of rich though faded damask, with a lofty tester, and stood in a niche opposite a bow window. I had scarcely got into bed when a strain of music seemed to break forth in the air just below the window. I listened, and found it proceeded from a band, which I concluded to be the waits from some neighboring village. They went round the house, playing under the windows. I drew aside the curtains to hear them more distinctly. I drew aside the curtains to hear them more distinctly. The moonbeams fell through the upper part of the casement, partially lighting up the antiquated apartment. The sounds as they receded became more soft and aerial, and seemed to accord with quiet and moonlight. I listened and listened. They became more and more tender and remote, and as they gradually died away, my head sank upon the pillow, and I fell asleep. End of Christmas Eve. Read by Kristen McQuillan, Tokyo, Japan.